Manchester United 1, Fulham 2, what a disaster, let's analyze. Alright, so the million dollar question is, why can't Manchester United control games? When it comes to controlling football games, there are actually two aspects. The first one is how do you use the ball? And the second one is your defensive shape. Now, of course, you watch the game and you've watched Manchester United throughout the season. The Manchester United players make a lot of mistakes. They're extremely wasteful in possession. We're not going to talk about that in this video. What I want to focus on, however, is our defensive shape. It's extremely loose and it's easily compromised. It's extremely easy for any opposition. We've even seen it against Wigan and Newport. For them to open us and carve us like um, Thanksgiving turkey because of our really poor defensive shape. And here I do have a few examples, all of them from the first half. This is very important because I'm going to make a point about Eric Ten Hag. Oh yeah! Mr. Scarlet Report is definitely talking about Eric Ten Hag in this video. So anyway, let's take it one step at a time. So here in this build-up sequence from uh, Fulham, as you can see, we do have a problem here. The first one, the obvious one, is that we do have three Manchester United players here, but Fulham does have four players. So that means there is always going to be one free outlet, one free player to pass the ball to. But anyway, so they get back to Leno over there. Now, already, as you can see here, there is a box of Fulham players with only two Manchester United players. The sequence continues with the ball going to Tosin. By the way, this guy, definitely keep an eye on him. He could be a great Manchester United uh, centre-back. Then he controls the ball. And then here what happens is that what you see here is that Forsen has no reason of being here. Kobe Mainu, who is he marking? I don't know. Casemiro now is busy with Andres Pereira, but as you can see, it will be. Fulham's very own JJ Okocha is making a move into the central uh, circle over here to receive the ball. But as you can see, the Manchester United players, they're trying to press high up the pitch, but none of them is doing it with purpose. None of them is doing it with intensity, which means Tosin, this is a great pass, by the way, can find it will be in between Casemiro and uh, Kobe Mainu. And here you're going to see the other problem, which is that even our center backs are lined up in a straight line. Our midfielders lined up in a straight line, the defenders lined up in a straight line with huge gaps here for players like Iwobi, Wilson or Pereira to exploit. This is so poor from Manchester United. You need verticality. And who is defending this area right here? And now Harry Maguire is coming out, but it's already too late because now Wilson to Pereira, Kobe Mainu cannot track Iwobi, Pereira towards Iwobi, and this was a great play from Fulham. This was really well played, but honestly, we made it easy for them. Iwobi should have scored this. He should have put that away, you know? But anyway, that was a great chance for, um, for uh, Fulham. Now, here's another sequence. I'm showing you three sequences just, just, just to show you how common this is against Manchester United. It was the case against Luton Town as well. So anyway, the ball again goes towards Tosin, and as you can see, who is marking who? I don't know. Marcus Rashford is just strolling around. Bruno Fernandes is committed, but here, look, Kobe Mainu and Casemiro are both overcommitted. These are our three central midfielders, and they, the three of them are all in the final third area. So who is protecting the defensive line? Nobody. And Forsen here, too far. Oh, now, of course, he's a young player. He's making his uh, uh, start for Manchester United. I'm not blaming him, but, you know, Eric Ten Hag should have given him guidance on this. Look how much space there is between Mainu and Forsen. This is not a good defensive structure. So anyway, now what happens is that Castagna is moving a move, and here Tosin again, showing his ball-playing ability. This is a very good centre-back, guys. And I think, I need to check my facts, but I think that he's going to be available on a free this summer, this could be a good buy for Manchester United. Anyway, look, beautiful chipped pass in the path of Castagna, taking out three Manchester United players. Now here, Castagna goes in and too, too much space. Uh, Lindelof is not really, like, this is Wilson. He needs to be marking Wilson over here. He doesn't really occupy any meaningful space right here. There is a lot of waste. The ball goes in towards Andres Pereira. And again, you find yourself in a situation with 3v4. Against Fulham at Old Trafford from a build-up sequence. This is extremely embarrassing, guys. It's embarrassing. But now the third sequence, something amazing is going to happen. Uh, and amazing, I'm being sarcastic here. The ball comes in, and here what we see is that the Manchester United players have actually learned their lesson somewhat. So now we see the players are actually tighter. For example, Kobe Mainu on Lukic over here. Okay? And then uh, Garnacho over here on uh, Reed. So, Castagna is actually having a decision to make, Pereira is also taken, because the point of pressing high, what is the point of it? Is to mark each player so tightly 
that they are unattractive targets. Therefore, forcing players like in Castagna or Tosin's situation to just go long, where you would uh, count on someone like Maguire or Varane to just win the aerial duel, and that's how you win the ball back. But here, they're going to have an outlet, which is Harry Wilson, who just comes in deep. Now, who is marking him? So he's the right winger. Our left back, Lindelof, is supposed to be marking him. But Lindelof here does not want to overcommit centrally because he knows that Castagna have gone through Garnacho. Therefore, he's going to be able to exploit that right wing. He is stuck in a place where he needs to make two choices. And as a defender, you usually just take the safer option in that situation. But this just shows that the Manchester United defensive structure was compromised from the beginning. Now, there is a reason why I took just the clips from the first half. It's because I'm trying to make a point that I'm going to make at the end of the video. So anyway, let's just move on to the next uh, sequence. So here, uh, Wilson's pass got intercepted. Now, let's talk about set pieces. That's how full I'm more able to score the goal. Now, here is a set piece that uh, here is a situation that really baffles me. Now, let's look at this again from the first half. An in-swinger from Pereira coming towards Muniz, targeting this, uh, you know, this uh, left corner, if you're looking at it from uh, Onana's side, of the uh, six-yard box. In-swinger towards this area, Muniz comes in, Heather, Onana makes a beautiful save and keeps us in the game. Now, this sequence is not the same one, just from a different angle. This is a whole other chance. Again, in-swinger into this area right here, Muniz comes in, Heather, and then Casemiro clears it. Otherwise, that would have gone in. So, now the question is, in the second half, what did Eric Ten Hag do to address that? Because the goal that Fulham scored was exactly like those sequences that I've just shown you. Fulham came in with one corner routine. One. And they used it effectively and they kept using it until they scored with it. Now here we see a few problems already. Kobe Mainu, Martin Muniz, who is very dangerous. He's 186 uh, 86 meters tall, he's quite good in the air. Then we have Tosin, also another tall center back, very good in the air, marked by McTominay, that one makes sense. And then Ericsson, marking Bassi. How? <laughs> how? How is that? How do you think that's gonna turn out, right? So the ball comes in, and as you can see here, look, Bassi quickly pushes Ericsson in, and he's moving now, Tosin, smart guy. I really want this guy at Manchester United. He's just blocking Ericsson so that he cannot track the run, and then the ball drops in beautifully from Andres Pereira. He puts in the header. The ball comes in. And then here, uh, Rashford and Varane, as you can see from the following uh, sequence, simply don't put their bodies on the line. What was that? It's going to be even more obvious now. Look. So here, Bassi pushes Christian Eriksen. Look at Tosin. You see Tosin just using his back to block off Eriksen's run. Now, Bassi has got a clear run. Shots on goal. Comes back. And look, what is Rashford doing? Just turning his back. Rule number one, when defending in these situations, you put yourself between the goal and the ball. That's what you do. Where is your bravery, man? Same thing for Varane. This is just not good enough. And that's how we conceded the goal. And that's why we deserve to lose this game. All right, so let's talk about Eric Ten Hag. But before that, I need to tell you this. As a YouTuber, I always look at ways to improve the quality of my videos, okay? And over the past few months, I've been really looking at some uh, data and video analysis software that I could use to enhance the quality of the videos. And there are some really powerful ones. I mean, they can allow you to have a clear picture of the data, as well as clear analysis of the video using player tracking, heat maps, etc. in real time. It's amazing. That means if I use those in my channel right here, I could give you a live analysis of the game when I analyze it in real time and then a more refined version post-match. But of course, those softwares are extremely expensive. They cost tens of thousands in yearly subscription fees. But the big clubs have them. Which now brings me to the question, did Eric Ten Hag and his staff not see what I just showed you in this video? Because if they didn't see it, then that's incompetence. If they saw it and they overlooked it, then that's negligence. And in both cases, that's just not good enough. That is Eric Ten Hag and his staff's responsibility. But there is a third option, which is that they saw it and they relayed the message and gave the players instructions. But the players failed to implement it. In that case, why? Is it because they didn't understand it or because they are unable technically and physically to implement it, which I highly doubt, or because they don't care? And the answer to this question, there are so many variables that I cannot answer that question from where I am here. I cannot tell you for sure. And I'm not a guy who is into speculation. 
So if I don't know something for a fact, I'm not going to tell you. But I would love to hear what you guys have to say on this. Your opinion matters. Leave a comment in the comment section below and just tell me what do you think is wrong with Manchester United when it comes to structure. And whatever it is that Ineos are doing behind the scenes right now, our biggest priority, I don't really care about who we are buying next summer or who's going to be the next manager, we just have to make sure that there is no disconnect between what the manager wants to implement and what the players are actually, for a fact, implementing on the pitch. So please let me know what uh, you think of this in the uh, comment section below. I hope that you've enjoyed this tactical analysis video. Until next time, cheers.